Welcome to Books Every Christian Should Read by Seahart Press, where we discuss some of the greatest Christian literature of all time, written by some of the greatest disciples of Jesus. May their words encourage us to walk more closely with him. My name is Christian Raffetto, and today my friend Eugene and I are going to be discussing The Pursuit of God by A.W. Tozer in the Seahart Timeless series. To get your own copy of this book, Every Christian Should Read, click on the link in the description below. Let's get started. Hey, Eugene. How's it going? Christian, it is great. I decided for one of my favorite books to wear my new grandma glasses that I accidentally bought. So here we are. I'm feeling very studious and nerdy, and I feel great. It's perfect. Thank perfect you. for the subject matter. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. <laughs> so, man, Tozer. Uh, let, what, what's his deal? What, give, me, give me a little bit of background on who he is and uh, what he did. Well, yes. One thing I love about Tozer is he was a true student of the word, which is obviously deeply important for all of us who would follow Jesus. But I even mean more so, he didn't really have much uh, formal spiritual education. I, I think, Christian, weren't we just looking this up that no seminary even? I think he just simply was accosted by the Holy Spirit, had to have more of Jesus, and then was a voracious reader and thinker, but really not very formally trained, which is fascinating for all the ministry and writing he did. So I, I think that's kind of a cool part of his life. He uh, met the Lord in Akron, Ohio, served uh, in ministry there and in West Virginia and in Chicago and in Toronto. Um, so all over. And um, yeah, his his passion for the Lord is contagious. Um, mm -hmm. I want to read um, this one line because I think this kind of summarizes at least this book, if not sort of, it sort of gives you a flavor of his writing just across the board with all of his books. To have found God and still to pursue him is the soul's paradox of love. So though we know God, we still continue to seek him. And it's scorned indeed by the too easily satisfied religionist, but justified in happy experience by the children of the burning heart. Mm. Just this thought that like, religion is dead and is just all too easily satisfied but those who really seek the lord can never they never have enough of him they're constantly going deeper yeah. um to me that seems like what tozer is all about absolutely and i'll i will attest to that because as we were bringing out our editions not only of the pursuit of god but knowledge of the holy one was written earlier in life one was written later in life that insatiability is just the same from when he was younger to when he was older. He's like, I cannot get enough, neither should you. So I think, yeah, you hit the nail on the head because that children of the burning heart comment, I mean, you and I have talked about that many times over the last few years. That's what we want is to be sort of having like this forest fire going on in our heart and it's burning up more of our inner life. We want more and we want to see more. I love that. That's, that's insatiable. What a great word. So take us through the book, Eugene. What um, what are some of your favorite parts? Mm. What what do I need to remember? It's been it's been like a couple of years since I read it, and I have a terrible recall. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just walk us through the book. And that's going to be our next video podcast. Is actually every book Christian should try and remember. Sometimes uh, <laughs> it's going to be pretty powerful. But this book, <laughs> Pursuit of God. I was just saying to Christian off camera before we started. As I was flipping back through some of the dog years in my copy, and also I went back, probably it was 10 years old, like a Word doc where I had typed out a bunch of my loves in this book. Something that struck me over and over is Tozer will take a big uh, theological or sort of philosophical word, and he'll boil it down to an image, like a, a picture that we can readily bring to mind. And I love that because it... It refocuses me in the midst of, say, a day where I'm I'm struggling and everything feels very sort of diffuse and and not real. So I'll give you. I, I wrote a few of these down. Um, like for instance, when he talks about the faith, kind of what does it mean to be part of the faith, Christendom, Christianity? 
he actually describes it as being at table with God. And I can readily picture that. I have dinner every evening with my family and it's lovely and we're talking and we're reflecting. Well, he is saying that the Christian faith is nothing less than being at table with the Godhead. And I mean, doesn't that sort of ugh, light you up? I noticed you used the, just a minute ago the word religion. You know, back when he was writing the word religion didn't maybe have some of the negative connotations it does today. When he talks about what he calls New Testament religion, he talks about, this is a great turn of phrase, continuous unembarrassed interchange between God and man, that God speaks to us unembarrassedly and that we receive that, that we talk to him that way. There's this openness and communication. That brings me to one of my other favorite pictures. He talks about what is our access like? You know, how may we go to God? And he says, it is us pushing into the throne room presence. So we can Pictured like a, a, an earthly throne room, well, imagine the heavenly throne room, the Father, uh, the Son at his right hand. And Tozer says that our access is pushing in. It's going all the way in. Um, what is belief, according to A.W. Tozer? It is simply gazing upon Jesus. The more we look into that face, the more we actually take on his nature and trust and uh, courage to trust even more. So that's belief. And then he goes further on toward the end of the book. This one is one of my favorites, Christian. In fact, I think we talk about this in our edition of the Sea Heart Press, uh, Pursuit of God. I use this in the foreword, the idea that unity in the body is all of us gazing upon Jesus. So the more that we all affix our eyes to him, the more that will naturally we get along. Naturally, we have just great decision-making within the church because all we're talking and thinking about is Jesus himself. So I love that each part of what is very complex becomes so simple because it's pictures. It's just ideas, right. images that we can latch onto. I also think this is really important. I think this may be the greatest book to help us understand the difference between, and these are real theologically words, the imminent and the manifest presence. What is the difference? How do each relate to each other? And how do each of us uh, as followers of Jesus, how do we engage with both the imminent and the manifest presence? So I could ramble on, but those are my highlights and I am passionate about them. Yeah. One of the other, to build on what you're saying, one of the other word pictures from Tozer that I remember and that we've talked about is the um, the tuning fork picture. Can yep. you, can you enlighten us about yeah. that one? Yeah. And that's the one I'm referring to from the forward. And it is so worthwhile to just even look that up. If you have our edition, um, it's this idea. And he says, some may fear that we are turning all of this into sort of an individualized religious experience, but have you never thought that a hundred pianos all tuned to the same fork are naturally in tune with each other. That's a paraphrase, but pretty close to what he says. And I love that image because if Christian and me spend today only thinking about Jesus and sort of gazing into his face and reading his words and wanting to live them out, well, then we, if we run into each other on the street, it's unlikely we're going to break out into some, you know, esoteric theological argument. No, we're going to be like, have you been thinking about Jesus? I've been thinking about Jesus. Let's go love people with the love of Jesus. I just, oh, that tuning fork, that one gets me all the time. I love that picture of the tuning fork that Tozer uses because his work is so targeted to the individual, but not at all to the detriment of the body. Um, he's, he's about your and my personal experience with the person of Jesus. And it's clear from the way this guy writes and from his vocabulary and from the way he can take these giant concepts and boil them down to something so simple that he's, a, he's brilliant brilliant thinker, but he does not get caught up in theology. Um, he, he recognizes the importance of it, but not, not to the exclusion of personal, of, of like the, the, the heart behind knowing Jesus. Yeah. And I think that he just strikes a balance that you don't really see much today. Um, 
of someone who can who can be so smart in like kind of the just he's biblically learned right mm. but his passion is for the person of Jesus you're nailing one of the great thoughts from one of our dear friends pastor bill johnson who says that Jesus is perfect theology i think that's what we see in tozer as well that he is so focused on the person of Jesus that the word, as we know from John 1, has become his whole life. And so what is the sort of derivation of theology? Theos logos, the word of God. He's like, listen, Jesus is. He's not just attributes of God. He is God. He, If we focus on him, we are not missing out on anything. I think that's very much at the heart of Tozer's message. So you're nailing it. That's that's why he has this sort of intensity. I think that's why at times Tozer was misunderstood in his day was because he wasn't real flowery of language. And he wasn't, again, formally educated like some of the other pastors of his day, but he just had that burning heart. And he's like, I don't care what anybody else says, more Jesus all the time. So yeah, it comes across in the pages, no doubt. So I guess and maybe this is a silly question, or maybe we've we've already talked around it. But what is the kind of the main theme of this particular book, especially as it as it's separate from his other works? Yeah, you know, and I'll actually pull out my copy right now. Um, early on, very early, in fact, it's in the preface. There is a line, and this is with that idea of the family table I talked about before. I think this is a haunting opening to the book, and this is why he wrote it. He says it is a solemn thing and no small scandal in the kingdom to see God's children starving while actually seated at the Father's table. And so he sets this idea in front of us that, hey, guess what? How lovely. We're all sitting here at the table. Some of you haven't dug in yet. Some of you are leaning back in your chair, looking the other direction, and there's a beautiful feast in front of you. Begin to lean forward, begin to pursue, begin to eat. So that's kind of the foundation that he lays. I want you to eat what's yours. That's the beginning. And then I'll flip just a little further because there's another one that matters to me in that same vein. This is that idea of access and pursuit. Listen to this. It says, ransomed men need no longer pause in fear to enter the Holy of Holies. God wills that we should push on into his presence and live our whole life there. And so what he's trying to do is teach us how do we wake in the morning? How do we think rightly yes about God? But how do we in actual practical physical experience live our days in conformity to God and in pursuing something more than we had yesterday? So it's a relentlessness. We talked before about insatiable. That's what he's trying to teach us is that's the spirit of the early church, as he calls it, New Testament religion. That's what we need in our day, when he was talking in his day, and in ours today. So, But yes, again, insatiability. How do we get it and how do we keep having it, regardless of the fact that you know the days go by and at times we grow a little insensible? Right at the beginning of the book, in the preface and first chapter, um, Tozer's pretty hard on sort of the on the church, not not the bride of Christ herself, but on kind of the establishment or sort of the system of church that we have, I guess that we had in his day and that we I think continue to have today. Um, is that fair? See, is, is he? You think he's fair to? Um, like, or, or maybe maybe a better way of saying it is, does that critique still hold true in our modern era? Yeah. Well, you know, I think we can offer our opinions just like he is. And I do think it still stands. Um, I think what he's pointing out is what we see in the Gospels, that there's nothing that makes Jesus more furious than people standing in the way of direct access. And so he's furious at the temple when they're trying to, you know, change coins and sell you this, sell you that. He rips that apart. When he meets with the scribes and Pharisees, he doesn't detest them 
individually as people, but he detests any way of thinking and the tradition that would stand in the way of normal people approaching the Godhead. And so to those points in Jesus, well, Tozer is saying, listen, we're putting this kind of theology in front of actually knowing God. Or we're putting, and uh, Tozer gets into this in lots of his books, we're creating sort of an entertainment as faith perspective. Like, let's make it so fun or so interesting that people will flock through the doors. He's saying, you know what? That is a unique way to block people's experience of the Godhead by sort of dumbing it down. I think we'd still all do all those things. We try to make it so fascinating or entertaining or colorful and at the end of the day, all it is is the bearded man from Nazareth saying, hey, I am God. Come walk in my way. It may be impossibly difficult today. I'm with you. It may be filled with joy. Well, it's my joy. So Tozer's just trying to kind of clean out our eyes and say, gaze upon Jesus. Don't look at all these trappings. Don't look at these brick and mortar buildings. Don't listen to that fancy pastor who has like the three-point theology that's so exciting and interesting. Follow Jesus. That's what he's saying. So I think he's right. What do you think, Christian? When you ask that question, I sense that it's a loaded question, but what are your it thoughts? It's a little loaded. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, no, I think he's right on. Um, and I don't say that in, in you know, like I said, I've worked in ministry. I, I've done those things. Like I've tried to make the gospel um, a little fancier, a little more appealing, a little more, um, I don't know, it's like seeker sensitive. Um, and I've, I've been disappointed. <laughs> um, I've been disappointed myself, like, you know, as someone trying to like sort of propagate or prop up, uh, a structure instead of just simply knowing and pointing to my, my friend, Jesus. Yeah. Um, so when I, when I actually read this book, I was in sort of this weird, no, let me back up. Initially, I was working in ministry as a youth pastor at a small church and I picked up this book and I like couldn't handle it. It was like mm. too much. And um, yeah, there's, there's something I read this in um, one of our, our other friends who's an author, Michael Phillips, just wonderful guy uh, and just super eloquent. He says, there's just certain times in your life where a book, like where, where specific books will speak to you. Um, and if you're not there yet, maybe that book is not going to speak to you. Maybe you can't hear it yet. Right. And that was my experience initially with the pursuit of God. I opened it and I was like, man, this guy is intense. And I don't know if I'm ready for intense right now. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to like build my career in ministry. <laughs> um, and then many years later, after being sort of just disenchanted with the whole like project after sort of like being not backslidden, but definitely, um, I don't know, kind of not interested in the Lord. Um, he sort of continued to like speak to me and like woo me and capture my heart. And then I picked up this book at that point again and read it. And I was like, oh yeah, this is what it's all about. This is what this guy is describing is what I have been wanting and have not experienced because I've been sort of like, wandering around in this entertainment theology. It's just mm. about a person. That person happens to be God himself in the flesh. Yeah. And like, man, what is more <laughs> fascinating and gripping than that? Um, nothing. So good. nothing. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Um, yeah. So uh, that was, that was a circuitous answer to your question, but yes, I do believe it's true. And I say that as somebody who's participated in that kind of just silliness of um, kind of performing church, going through the motions. Um, the the picture that you were talking about being at table, um, our friend Delton Lehman, who's, who writes for the Sea Heart blog, awesome writer, awesome guy. Um, he talks about the God of the table, um, mm -hmm. how, how he, that's one of his articles, how God is constantly kind of offering us this hospitality, this intimate fellowship. Um, and that's sort of what Tozer is all about. Like, let's come into this fellowship together. Um, yeah. yeah. So good. You referenced earlier the quote about imminent versus manifest. 
Can you speak yeah. to that a little more? Because um, absolutely, yeah, that was that was kind of an interesting point for me offline, and I'd love love to hear more about it. Love for our our viewers and listeners to hear about it too. And I like how you just described your readerly journey of trying to read and then coming back to the book. I remember the first time I read this book. I don't remember what year it was, but I remember the season. It was late summer, and I remember sitting on my deck, and I got to the part about imminent versus manifest, and it was one of those moments like. Oh, I've never understood this. Thank you, Tozer, for making this clear. So in case you've ever heard those kind of fancy sounding words, here's the basic idea. Uh, the word imminent that I'm using is not the word imminent with an I in the middle. It has a letter A in the middle, like imminent presence. And what that means, I was saying to Christian earlier, like we're recording this on an October day. And if I look out the window... There are some beautiful uh, yellow cottonwood trees here in Colorado, and it's fall. It's lovely. Well, the imminent presence of God is his presence sort of all around us in creation. Just he is so big and omnipresent that he's everywhere, always present. His creation shows him. My breath shows him. I mean, he is the I am. That's the imminent presence. We can't get away from him. The manifest presence, and Tozer's so good on this, is when he really speaks. You know, it's the burning bush moment. It's the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost. It's that time in your own life when you really heard like a whisper in your spirit and you're like, whoa, that's God talking to me. That is the manifest presence. It could be as little as you're reading scripture in the morning and one of those verses just jumps off the page. That's an experience of the manifest presence. Like he's like, look at this. The imminent, again, is sort of the all around you. The manifest is like a, kind of like a finger in your chest saying, pay attention. I am the speaking God. So Tozer is killer on that theme. And if you want to know more about that, there's a whole chapter where he really unpacks it. It's one of the center points of this book. Yeah, I've got that chapter up in here, The Speaking Voice. Yeah, I think that it's that you're referring one. To? I remember the title. Yep. Uh, chapter six. So this is fascinating. He says here, on page 89 in the Sea Harp edition. It is my own belief that every good and beautiful thing which man has produced in the world has been the result of his faulty and sin-blocked response to the creative voice sounding over the earth. Hmm. Sort of the idea that that, uh, that imminent presence of God um, kind of stirs up uh, and gives life to our ability to create. Hmm. Um, and uh, I love that it's something like us being creative as, as just mankind um, is our subconscious and unwitting mm. response to our creator. Yeah. Um, and that's, I, I wouldn't say that's a major theme here, but it, he kind of touches on it. And I've always thought that was really beautiful. Um, yeah. Just that we, like, like you were saying, we cannot get away from yeah. this God who made us and knows us and loves us, even if we, even if we are like kind of actively running away, yeah. just our very life and our, our act of like living and creating is, is a response to him. And actually that, that reminds me, I noticed you said earlier something about sort of the spirit of genius in Tozer. In that same section, now that you're saying that, it reminds me, he talks about that and he might even capitalize the G in genius. Uh, and it's a very kind of almost like Greek, you know, back in the day, they would talk about the muses were kind of speaking to an author or poet. Well, he really says, and it's his interpretation of human existence, that when we see genius at play in the world, whether it's a believing or a non-believing, say, author or filmmaker, that there is something uh, godly in that being borne out. And then he talks a little bit about what does it mean when we are really sort of uh, going in the direction with God of his genius. And I think that's an aspect of that manifest presence that he gets at. And it's it's pretty out there in terms of like, you don't see a lot of modern day authors in, in, who are writing about Jesus talking about sort of the spirit of genius. But I think it's a powerful argument being made again by a semi uneducated guy. It's beautiful. Yeah, he says also on starts on 89. What then is genius? Could it be that a genius is a man haunted by the speaking voice, mm. laboring and striving like one possessed to achieve ends which he only vaguely understands? 
that the great man may have missed God in his labors, that he may even have spoken or written against God does not destroy the idea that I'm advancing. Wow. Isn't that great? That's like, that's a high piece of philosophy right there. I love that. talks about at the and you touched on this at the beginning the um one of the later chapters is the gaze of the soul yeah um what does he mean by that and yeah Yeah. and how do we i guess what does he mean by that and how do we do it yeah i'm gonna go straight to the page just like you did because on page 100 in the sea harp edition this is one of my favorite bracketed texts he says believing then is directing the heart's attention to Jesus. It is lifting the mind to, quote, behold the Lamb of God and never ceasing that act of beholding for the rest of our lives. At first, this may be difficult, but it becomes easier as we look steadily at his wondrous person, quietly and without strain. Distractions may hinder, but once the heart is committed to him, after each brief excursion away from him, the attention will return again and rest upon him, like a wandering bird coming back to its window. Isn't that pretty? That's really beautiful writing. But what he's meaning is when we see the original disciples, what did they see? They saw a man. And as John writes in 1 John, you know, this was life himself coming into their frame of reference. They could physically look at him. He would speak. He put his hand on their shoulder, so they were focused on his person. Well, they continued that way for three years of days, and then at the ascension, they lost his physical presence. It did not change the way that they focused their hearts upon him. They continued to wake in the morning, and we can imagine their prayer life just being sort of closing the eyes and gazing upon his presence by his spirit. That's what Tozer would have us be about is focusing in the Gospels, focusing in our prayer life, focusing in our work life on the embodied incarnation of God, Jesus. Thinking about him, loving him, obeying his words. So keeping all our attention on him. And then anytime our mind wanders, like he says, like a bird coming back to its window, oh, wait a minute, Jesus. So I think that's the simplicity of belief in his context is just focused attention. Oh, Jesus, you again, just minute by minute, all day long. And it's really a lovely way to live. And I think that's where we see the intensity in Tozer throughout all his books. This guy could just not stop thinking about Jesus. Well, let's try it. That was really well said. Yeah. You think so? I think so. Well, I'm, I, I'm inspired by, uh, by our buddy A.W. I mean, he just gets <laughs> you so fired up. Mm-hmm. No, and that harkens to our conversa- to a previous conversation we've had about um, Andrew Murray's book, Abide in Christ. Similar kind of idea that, um, yeah, just sort of the, that, that the direction of our mind's eye mm. kind of, um, yeah, sets us up for whether or not we are in fact abiding. Yeah. Um, are, we, are we dwelling upon him? It doesn't need to be sort of this, um, I, love that, I love that he uses the, the word gaze because it doesn't it doesn't need to be like um, more complicated than that, right? It's just right. in the way that you look at something and 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 uh, sort of direct your attention to it. That's that's what it is. Um, yeah, it's not. I don't know. It's not more like religious than that, which is yeah. Cool. And the way that he paints it, just to give another one of his great sort of word pictures. In that chapter, he's talking about the moment that's famous in the 40 years wandering of the uh, Israelites in the desert. He talks about that bronze snake moment when they're being attacked by the vipers and they're you know, dying of you know, snake venom. And th- Moses is instructed to make this bronze snake and hold it up. And it says that whoever looks at it, they're healed. And that's the picture that Tozer gives us. He says, listen, life essentially is like these snakes coming at us and it's our unbelief and it's the ways of the world and the culture around us. He's saying, listen, all you have to do is this. Look at him, raise your eyes, gaze upon him again, remember him and all is well because that's what belief is, the direction of the soul's affection. It's pretty cool.
It's the very last chapter, chapter 10, called The Sacrament of Living. It's a fascinating phrase. And I love that he's just got these like phrases, these like three or four word, just like chunks that are just like really make you think like the sacrament of living. What is that? Um, What, what is the idea in that chapter? It's really the idea that our entirety of our lives can become sacramental, meaning holy and lifted up in the direction of God. So whether we are a pastor or we are a teacher in a grade school, like we can actually live this life with Jesus in such a way that we ourselves are living sacramentally and others are drawn into it by seeing the power of it, the joy of it. So he's just giving us, again, sort of raising our eyes to something higher and more robust in the midst of our Christian life. So kind of by way of summing up our conversation here um, and also just sort of by describing what we're trying to do here on this podcast. Um, on page 19, he says, come near to the holy men and women of the past and you will soon feel the heat of their desire after God. And so I think that's what we're doing with the Timeless series uh, and with this podcast that we want to like sort of what was done by the people who wrote these books. Like, I want that. I want that hunger. And so I want to read what they wrote. I wanted to, I want to see how they lived. And I want to try to do that. Uh, that idea that Paul says of, of follow me as I follow Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, so well said Tozer couldn't have said it better myself. So good. Um, and that's, that's really what uh, the reason I'd encourage you uh, to keep listening to this podcast, keep watching um, and, and read these books because they, Really, it's not so much about the books or the, the people, the authors. It's about Jesus, and it's about how mm-hmm. they point us to him in really practical ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so just by way of encouragement. Uh, Absolutely. Let's follow Tozer as he follows Christ. Yeah. Um, Eugene, any closing thoughts for our viewers? You know, as we've talked about, and I'm sure it's come across, there is a deep passion, sort of a burning passion in Tozer. And I think that is my takeaway from this book is there's always more. We may reach out and take hold of that which is ours. And so if there's any part of you, whether you're listening or watching us, who's just starting to feel like the Christian life is boring, well, guess what? You're wrong. It's not. Just maybe the way it's been taught to you, the way it's been demonstrated to you has been somewhat lifeless, somewhat dull. Tozer would look you in the eye just like I am right now and saying, oh, it's a thrill. There's a never ending excitement. The call is huge. At at times it will cost you everything. But if you don't want to be bored anymore, this is the kind of book you should be reading. I would also add, Christian, we have actually done an entire book audio of this. So if you're interested in listening along to it, uh, go to our YouTube channel, listen along because It's actually me that read it, and I had the time of my life recording it because it really went down deep into my heart even as I was reading these beautiful sentences. So I'd encourage you to listen to it along with reading it. Yeah, I'll put the link in the show notes. Um, Yeah, you did a great job reading that book. It's it's really engaging. thanks, man. Appreciate it. (laughs) Cool. Well, thanks, Eugene, for the time. Always a pleasure. Christian, great to be with you, and thank you to all of you viewers and watchers. We're just so grateful to have you with us. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Books Every Christian Should Read by Seahart Press. Click on the link in the description below to get your own copy of The Pursuit of God in the Seahart Timeless series. Also, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you like this podcast, you should check out our e-magazine. You can find it at seahart.com. Subscribe there so you never miss our offering of articles, podcasts, videos, music, Also, you can connect with us on the socials at Seahart Press. Thanks so much for listening and for coming along with us as we follow Jesus together.